But we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verse 1 is where we're going to pick up. And what's happening now is that at this section of the Gospel of John, we're getting ready to watch the pieces of the puzzle come together for the moment of the cross itself. We've been in a lot of teaching over the last several chapters. If you have a red letter Bible and you go back to the beginning of chapter 13, most of what you see in your Bible between 13 and the end of chapter 17 is red letter. It's the teaching of Jesus Christ. It's the prayer of Christ, his high priestly prayer in chapter 17. But now when we get into chapter 18, the drama itself begins to unfold. And the pieces come together for the cross of Christ. What we start reading here in the next chapter and a half or so is G Judas betrays Jesus and Jesus is arrested in our passage this morning. Christ is brought on trial and false witnesses are brought to bear against Jesus Christ. His disciples either flee or deny him or both. Crowds will actually demand the release of a serial killer instead of Jesus Christ, and a Roman governor folds under the pressure. What we're getting ready to read is, from one point of view, it looks like the enemies of Jesus Christ are going to get their way. At least they think they're going to get their way. From one point of view, what we read over the next couple of chapters is an unfolding tragedy, and it unfolds quickly. But it is, from this point of view, supremely unjust. But we are learning another perspective leading up to this moment. Jesus has told his disciples, we've read him say it, that the world hates him. And we have read throughout this gospel that the Pharisees have been conspiring to kill Jesus Christ, but Jesus never acted as if those things changed what he did. There were a few moments when they gathered to arrest him, but Christ escaped from them because his moment was not yet. But we read earlier on that Jesus tells the disciples the moment is now. And he taught the disciples that they could have peace and they could have joy because even through this night, Jesus tells them, I have already overcome the world. Christ has taught these things to them and to us. But on this night, the night in which Jesus is arrested, the teaching becomes real. And we watch Jesus Christ submit to the will of his Father, and get arrested, and go to the cross. Here are some thoughts that are going to help us understand and make sense of this passage of Scripture. And the first is this. We've seen this a few times, but tonight it happens in this dramatic fashion. Jesus is in complete control. Judas and the religious and political leaders of the day throw a lot of the kind of power that they have at Jesus Christ. And Jesus lets them know who is in control charge. So Jesus is in complete control of this event. It's an important concept to sink into our hearts and minds as we watch the events of the cross unfold. Christ is in complete control. Then we're going to see this, and it's going to be something that we touch on as we move through these next few chapters. The power that Jesus Christ wields is different from the world's power. It's different in kind. It's different in application. It's different in process. The power that Jesus Christ wields, the power of the kingdom of God, is not like the world's power at all. If it's not, well, if we could imagine all of the power that the world could muster against Jesus Christ, then we multiply it by a thousand, then we have the power of God. It's not like that. Because then we might imagine, in fact, the world is going to imagine, we're going to read this later on, the world is going to imagine that God's power is like that. So they're going to think at one point that we really can muster all of the power that we have and actually overthrow God. But the power that Jesus wields is different from the world's power. And then we see this in dramatic fashion. And I hope one way or another this sinks into us in a powerful way this morning. The will of the Father is the most important thing. The will of the Father 
is the most important thing. Well, let's read this part of the story, what the Word of God has to say here at the beginning of John chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. And Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? When Jesus had spoken these words, all of this teaching over the last several chapters, you go back and you read through some of that. John chapter 15, verse 1 begins with Jesus telling the disciples, let's get up and go from here and let's go for a walk. So they've been walking and listening to Jesus and Christ has been praying and walking with them. And now they arrive at their destination here at the beginning of chapter 18. They've headed east out of the city of Jerusalem and down the hillside, down the city, down the hill, excuse me, that the city is built on across a seasonal stream, the brook Kidron. This wadi that water would wash through from time to time. And then they go up the other side of the hill that is east of the city, what scripture calls the Mount of Olives. And somewhere along that path, as they're making their way up the side of the the hill of uh, the Mount of Olives, they end up in this garden. And it's the garden where they've been before. Jesus takes his disciples here. It is, as the other accounts in the Gospels tell us, the Garden of Gethsemane. I think this is important because John relates these details to us on purpose. Judas knew where to go. Jesus didn't hide from his betrayer. As they walked across the brook Kidron, the disciples probably could have led the way. They've been here before. Jesus has been here with Judas. He's taught them. He's ministered to them inside of this very garden. And so this is where Jesus goes. Jesus doesn't at the fork in the road say, hey, guys, Judas is probably waiting for us in this garden. Let's turn left and let's go to the other garden on the other side of the hill just so that we can avoid everything that's going to happen tonight. He doesn't do that. He goes straight back to the garden. Judas knew where to go, as John the disciple tells us, because Jesus had been here before with his disciples. Friends, the more I've spent time with this passage of Scripture, the more the setting strikes me, the more the drama, the scene itself strikes me. In the past, Judas has been here in the garden with the disciples, listening to Jesus, watching him minister, being ministered to by him. But this time Judas shows up and he's standing apart from Jesus and the rest of the disciples. Judas is now here. He's already betrayed Jesus, as John has put it. And he's here now with these soldiers and the temple guards. And they've been brought now to arrest Jesus Christ. 
So Judas brings some of these Roman soldiers and these officers, or as the other gospel accounts tell us, they're actually guards from the temple. So they're sent from the Pharisees and from the chief priests. Now through the gospel of John, we've read where the Pharisees have concocted ways to arrest Jesus and get him killed. I think it's interesting in this moment, at this night, the Pharisees aren't there. They've gone ahead and they've sent everybody else who has weapons. (laughs) They've sent them and they're gonna be someplace else. And the language is important for us here as you and I try to imagine what this scene looks like in the way that Jesus handles it with his disciples. When John the disciple says that Judas brought a band of soldiers, that word band in the Greek is the word that would have been used to describe a Roman cohort. A Roman cohort contains anywhere between 600 and 1,000 soldiers. So get that thought out of your brain that there's a couple of dozen people here with shields and spears. There might be as many as a thousand men with weapons to come and take Jesus Christ. They're genuinely worried about something. They're genuinely afraid of something. Will the crowds of people come to his defense? Not that long ago, we read about the triumphal entry. As Christ enters the city of Jerusalem, the crowds are hailing him as their coming Messiah. Do they have that in the backs of their minds? At the very least, and there's no way around this over the next few stories in the gospel, Jesus draws energetic hatred, really energetic hatred. They've come with weapons, lanterns, and torches to a man who has never lifted a finger in anger. And they've come with weapons and to a man who has a small band of disciples, most of whom are uneducated Galileans. I think these are important things to think through as we watch the cross unfold. The world musters all the power it has to silence Jesus and his disciples. The world musters all the power it has to silence Jesus and his disciples. Christ has been teaching them over the last few chapters that this kind of thing is going to happen to you. If you've watched it happen to me, believe me, it's going to happen to you because they've hated me. And if you love me, they're going to do these same kinds of things to you. He taught that, now we watch it unfold. But as we think about how this works and why it works this way, friends, think about it like this. There are two things in this universe that do not want the gospel of Jesus Christ to succeed. There are two things in this universe that do not want the gospel of Jesus Christ to succeed. The first is me, and the second is the devil. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Why do I say me? Because the testimony of scripture is clear and the testimony of human experience and human history is just as clear that every human being lost in their sin is an enemy of God's. This is what our sin does to us. It makes us callous to God. Scripture calls us enemies of God. We've been, we were lost in our sin and walking another way. And in our sinfulness, we don't want to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's how the apostle Paul, who himself experienced this radical conversion while he was on his way to do what? To get rid of as many disciples as he possibly could. To fulfill the words of Jesus Christ earlier on in this teaching, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. And Paul, who was then Saul, is on his way to Damascus to persecute disciples. And Jesus gets a hold of him like this. So Paul knows this story. And this is how he describes it in Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And he speaks of himself like this as well in several places. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, in the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, 
among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind, just like everybody else. This is how sin works inside of the human heart. So the gospel is good news. It's really good news because it changes that. It breaks that. The work of the Holy Spirit draws us into our salvation in Jesus Christ. The gospel is good news, but it's the good news of the surgeon's scalpel. We must become aware of our sinfulness. We must become aware of our need for Jesus Christ, that I am lost without him. And the human heart does not want to admit that. Maybe the easiest way for a human being to keep the work of Jesus Christ, to keep the gospel at bay, is just simply to believe I'm really not that bad. I mean, for Pete's sake, have you seen that other guy? Right? It's the easiest way to keep the gospel at arm's length. It's the good news of the surgeon's scalpel. So I in my sin do not want this to work because I want to remain Lord of my own life. Thank you very much. And then our enemy, the devil, he doesn't want this to succeed either. But the devil, he is on a collision course with eternal defeat and destruction. And so his desire right now, even as Paul described in that passage we read in Ephesians, his desire is to destroy as many of God's image bearers as possible, and he will stop at nothing. That might be a wonderful nutshell way of watching the world around us right now. That's like the subheading to almost every headline you're going to read this week. The devil wants to destroy as many of God's image bearers as possible, and he will stop at absolutely nothing. So the world throws all of the kind of power that it has at Jesus Christ to stop this process. They think that killing him is going to change this. But friends, part of the drama that is inside of what we just read here in the Word of God in John chapter 18 is this. Jesus defeats the world's power with a single word. Jesus defeats all of the world's power with a word. He just says, I am he. And the way John puts it, knowing everything that was going to happen, Jesus starts a conversation and he blows them off their feet. He blows them backward with a word. What do we read here in the ESV when Jesus says, I am he, who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. Well, I am he. In the Greek, it's actually a little bit more simple than that. Jesus just says, I am. You see, in this moment, Jesus reenacts what happens between Moses and God in the burning bush back in the book of Exodus chapter 3. That burning bush stops Moses and he's brought in. He begins to have this conversation with the God who's going to send him back into Egypt to free his people. And Moses says, when the people ask me who sent me, what do I say? And God simply says, tell them, I am sent you. It's a way of speaking of the name of God. This is who I am. And so when they say Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus reenacts that moment and he says, I am. And friends, maybe a thousand men and soldiers just fall over backwards. Well, if a thousand soldiers don't work, maybe 2,000 soldiers will do the trick. Maybe 10,000 soldiers will do the trick. What if we mustered all of the military and political might we could against Jesus Christ? Will that do the trick? Sounds a little bit like a silly question in this context, but this is exactly what Scripture anticipates. We go all the way back to the book of Psalms, chapter 2. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 6. The psalmist lays it out like this. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? 
The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords from us. He is not my God, I am my God. God's reaction is he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision, then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Bring it. This is what I'm going to do. My king will sit on my throne. And it doesn't matter what human beings and the devil do in their rebellion against me. Now that's the book of Psalms. That's David sort of watching this unfold. This is David reflecting on the power of God and the rebellion of humanity. Do we leave that in the Psalms? Do we think, well, that's powerful poetry. That's a great image of the kind of power that God has. Well, what we just read in Psalm 2 becomes real when we get to the end of the book in Revelation 19. And this is a very dramatic passage of Scripture, but I read this to help us understand that the power of God is different than the power of the world. That it does not matter what the world brings against Jesus Christ, he will reign as king forever and ever. And here, friends, is how it unfolds in Revelation 19, verses 19 through 21. And John the Revelator, who is also John the Disciple, the author of the gospel that we've been going through, what he sees here, the language, he sees the, the rebellion of humanity and the leaders of that rebellion set themselves up against Jesus Christ. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army, meaning Christ and his people. And here's how dramatic things are. Here's how long the battle lasts. And the beast was captured. Period. Done. <laughs> and the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet who in its presence had did the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that comes from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh, and he who sits in the heavens laughs. Who do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am. Friends, there is coming a day when the Jesus who knows everything that will happen to him, the Jesus who is loved by his children and hated by sinners and their demon God, will wipe all rebellion off the earth. Peter thought that night was this night. Again, the scene itself. Peter, who probably has a very small sword hidden on his side, in front, of, in front of this crowd of people, these professional soldiers, these temple guards, his former comrade disciple Judas, before all of these people, Peter just decides, now's the moment. He pulls out his sword, he cuts off the right ear, of this servant. His name is Malchus. Now, that's an interesting detail. A lot of scholars guess that we know his name because he eventually becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. The other stories tell us that as Jesus is talking to Peter and he's settling this poor guy down, <laughs> he puts the ear back on Malchus and he heals Malchus. Peter might be deciding that tonight is the night that this is going to happen. He draws his sword in hopeless attack, maybe even with his own promise ringing in his ears. He had told Jesus earlier on this night, I will go with you to the very end. Prison or death, I'm with you. He may have those words in his mind as he draws his sword. But this day is not that day. On this night, Jesus lets us know who is in charge. 
He lets the soldiers back up off the ground, and he goes willingly to the cross. On this night, Jesus allows himself to be kissed by Judas as a sign of betrayal. Whereas earlier that had been a sign of love between the two of them. Been kissed by Judas on the cheek is a sign of betrayal. On this night, Jesus protects his sheep from the soldiers. Well, if it's me that you seek, then let these go. And as the other gospel accounts tell it, they run, they flee. The vast majority of them flee. John says he said that to fulfill the word that he had spoken. And he'd spoken these words earlier on in John chapter 17. And then earlier even than that, we read in John chapter 10, those first 15 or so verses, said, I am the good shepherd. I don't lose any of these. I know their name and they know me. So on this night, Jesus protects his sheep. Why is tonight not the night for the judgment of evil and the final eternal establishment of the kingdom of God on earth? Jesus tells Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Now is not the night that gets fulfilled in Revelation 19 because a couple of things need to happen first. The first is that Jesus is going to fully and completely obey the will of the Father. And the second is that the cross must come first. So Jesus Christ obeys the will of the Father. We've read this language in the Gospel of John. He says, I have come to do everything the Father has given me to do. And when he prays, he says exactly, I've done everything you've told me to do. And now he continues in that obeying the will of the Father. And I want to think about this for a couple of moments. Obeying the will of the Father, especially at a moment like this. We need to know this. The will of God is always perfect. The will of God is always perfect. Whatever was on Peter's mind, whatever it was, the will of God was what was perfect. Now, this is a truism about God. If we think about who he is, if we just sort of list his character traits, if we step back from the drama of the night in which Jesus is arrested, and we just think about who God is, this is just a truism of who he is. If God is all-knowing, if God is all-powerful, if God is all-loving, then everything he wills, everything God commands, everything God wants is loving and good and perfect. So Jesus perfectly submits to the will of God, and we are saved because of that. The will of God, friends, transcends this situation. And here's what I mean by that. When it would have been easier to do something else, when the disciples would have thought that something else should have happened or could have happened in this kind of moment, it was the will of God that transcended all of that. And obeying God's will, doing what he commanded, was right in this situation, no matter what anyone else thought was the better thing to do. In fact, in the other gospel accounts, Jesus tells Peter, now listen, I could call down and command two legions of angels right now. We'd be free from all of this. But he tells Peter here what is right here and now is that I drink from the cup the Father has given me. Why is this not that night that we read in Revelation 19? Because Christ's obedience means our salvation. Christ's obedience means our salvation. And then, friends, our obedience as we follow Christ our obedience is good for us, and it is for the glory of God. We walk in these footsteps. We stand with Jesus in this evening. We learn what it means 
for the will of God to transcend whatever I think of my situation. It is the will of God that is right and that is perfect. We are expected as followers of Jesus Christ to obey the will of God even when something else would be easier. God fully knows and understands your condition and my condition. He fully understands the situations that we are in. He fully understands everything that we see and feel and live through is complication and fear and anxiety and the unknowing of the future. God knows all of that. I don't know what the future holds, but he does. I'm always drawn to that line in that old hymn, I do not know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand. It's always right and good for us to obey the will of God. The French theologian and reformer John Calvin just very simply says this, the only haven of safety is to have no other will, no other wisdom than to follow the Lord wherever he leads. It's only right for me, he tells Peter, to drink from the cup the Father has given me. So friends, we need to learn how to understand the will of God and value it for what it is. And to understand the will of God begins first and foremost, friends, with your relationship with the word of God, with your relationship with what God has revealed to us here inside of this word. Your understanding of the will of God does not begin with Pastor Phil's understanding of the word of God. Does that make sense? We come together and the spirit works and God leads and we are relit by the fire and passion of God amongst us. But you and I learning what it is to follow the will of God begins with you and the value that you place upon your relationship with Jesus Christ. There's some critical things in scripture about this. In fact, we read part of it this morning in prayer. Pastor Brooks read this as we were praying. Romans chapter 12 verses one and two. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Is my grasp of the will of God enough to keep me from conforming to the image of this world? Is my love for the word of God, the truth that is in the word of God, enough to be more attractive to me than what this world tells me life should be like? He says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Everything about who you are, not just the way you think about things, but the way you do things. So we are reformed by the renewing of our minds and we're conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We should constantly be coming back to that question, to whom are we conforming? Who do we look like? Who do we sound like? Is it the world or is it more and more like Jesus Christ? Then there is this beautiful verse in Psalm chapter 40, verse 8. The psalmist says, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Heart in the Old Testament isn't where our emotions are. It's where our character comes from. We live from our hearts, the book of Proverbs says. It's not where we feel from, it's where we live from. I delight to do your will, O God, because your law is the spring from which my life flows. And you and I, friends, in our walk with Jesus Christ, we develop this love for the will of God, that it is good and it is acceptable and it is perfect. And it is that delight, it is our attraction to our love for the will of God 
that's going to hold us together in the moment in which something else would be so much easier. We have to delight in the word of God. And then I love this thought as well from Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. Jesus is in the middle of a teaching, and in some ways it's a, it's a very difficult teaching for some people to hear. But Jesus eventually says, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Doing the will of God actually builds relationship with Jesus Christ. Obedience to him, obedience to his word, obedience to what God wants inside of my life actually draws me closer into relationship with Jesus Christ. It is like that with any appropriate relationship and so much more with our relationship with God. The more we obey the will of God, the more intimate and life-transforming that relationship becomes. So on this night in John chapter 18, you and I are being asked to stand with Jesus instead of standing with Judas. But on this night, now is not the time for the sword. Peter does what Peter does. Jesus fixes it. Jesus teaches us. Now is not the time for the sword. Now is the time for the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ has to happen. It must happen in order to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation with God possible, and to judge sin and the devil. The cross has to happen. The cross must happen because we are sinners, and God loves us enough to extend his mercy to us but he does it through the cross. Now, if Jesus on this night had decided, you know what, I'm not doing this, and he calls two legions of angels down, and he sets up the throne of David, I'll tell you what, that would have excited his disciples. Even later on, after his resurrection, he teaches with the disciples in the beginning of the book of Acts, the disciples say, well, now is it time to restore the kingdom to David? We have to get rid of these Romans. We have to put you back on the throne. We have to have the eternal physical kingdom that we thought you came to bring. If Jesus on this night had done that, his disciples would have died in their sin. Do you understand? They would have died in their sin. So before that happens, the cross must happen. Because of the cross, because of Christ's obedience at the cross, Reconciliation with God is possible. The judgment of sin occurs, and you and I have relationship for all of eternity with Jesus Christ. Jesus knows the cross must happen, and it actually has torn his heart. In the Gospel of Matthew, we get a longer version of this night, and here's part of what happens in Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with them to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with them Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Not my will be done, but may your will be done. Jesus uses this word in Matthew 26. He uses this word when he talks to Peter in John chapter 18. God has given him a cup to drink. This is important language. Because this is common Old Testament language for the outpouring of God's wrath on sin. The cup just fills with the rebellion of the nations and eventually it begins to pour over the top and the cup of wrath gets poured out. And Jesus says, it's right that I drink the cup the Father has given me. Friends, this is a a stunning reality of the cross of Jesus Christ. 
Not only will the only innocent man be executed, but he will bear our sin for our sake. Listen to how the Apostle Paul puts it. It goes by very quickly, but it is, it is a stunning reality in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For our sake, he made him, God made Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This exchange that Jesus makes, he is holy and completely righteous. I am a sinner dead in my trespasses and sins. So the way that God fixes that is that God makes Christ who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might then be under the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Christ says, it's only right now that I drink the cup the Father has given me. So Christ submits to the will of the Father. He drinks the cup and he prays for the will of his Father to be done. The cross is the will of the Heavenly Father. This is the plan of salvation. What looks like from one perspective, what looks like defeat is a moment of human sin and demonic desire fulfilled, but it is all under the sovereign power and guidance of the will of God. And because Jesus submits to the will of the Father, sin is defeated and we are saved. I want to finish with this passage in Philippians. We've read a lot of scripture, but guys, it's important that we understand what's happening on this night and why Jesus does it this way. Philippians 2, verses 8 through 11. Speaking of Jesus, it says this, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So be it. Because Christ obeys, we are saved. And he is the eternal glorified King of Kings. Let's pray.